Good evening and welcome to the Museum of Fine Arts. I'm Ronnie Baer, the Mrs. Russell W. Baker Curator of Painting in the Art of Europe here at the museum and curator of the exhibition, The Poetry of Everyday Life, Dutch Paintings from Boston Collections. I'm delighted to welcome, to, to welcome you to what I expect will be an unusual and illuminating look at some of those paintings through the eyes of two of Boston's most renowned photographers, Laura McPhee and Abe Morell. When we began to think about programming for this exhibition, it occurred to us, and I can't take any credit for this, but Barbara Martin um, from our wonderful education, it, uh, it's not education, museum, learning, and public programs. <laughs> if anyway, it occurred to her that photographers are very often artists who seek out the poetry of everyday life, and that the work of these two photographers had definite affinities with the paintings in the exhibition. So we were very happy when they agreed to explore these affinities with us. And they have also agreed to take questions at the end of their presentations. Um, so stick around, there'll be more. To introduce them briefly before they begin, Laura, who will speak first, received her BA from Princeton and her MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. And she's been awarded both a Fulbright and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Since 1987, she has worked with a fellow photographer, Virginia Bean, in creating beautiful panoramic photographs that reflect the way people interact with the landscapes in which they live. Her work, their work, is in the collection of numerous museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and has been published in the extraordinary book, No Ordinary Land, Encounters in a Changing Environment. Laura is also the author, with her sisters Jenny and Martha McPhee, of a recent book of essays and photographs entitled Girls, a book based upon two years of interviews with young women across the country, and I can heartily recommend that. Laura clearly has a knack for collaboration, so it's not surprising that she was willing to share a lectern with her friend and colleague from the Mass College of Art, Abe Morell. I'm sure many of you remember Abe's work from the exhibition Abelardo Morel and the Camera Eye here at the MFA in 1999, an exhibition that included both memorable still lives and images in which an outside view magically enters an interior through the device of the Camera Obscura. Abe was born in Cuba and came to New York City with his family at the age of 14. He attended Bowdoin College and received his MFA from Yale University. Like Laura, he, he has work in the permanent collection of many museums, among them the Art Institute of Chicago and the Museum of Modern Art, and his photographs have been published in the book, A Camera in the Room. Abe has also been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and was an artist in residence at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum just a few years ago. So I know we're all in for a great treat tonight. Please join me in welcoming Laura McPhee and Abe Morell. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ronnie, and thank you, Barbara Martin, for dreaming this up, and thanks to April Kim also. When I was a teenager and visited museums like the National Gallery with my father, we had a game we played to prevent museum fatigue. We would each take a turn standing in the middle of the room, turning slowly, arm and forefinger extended, until we settled on a painting, which we would then approach and examine closely together. It was our theory that it was better to study two things in a gallery in detail rather than, and see more variety overall. My mother, on the other hand, looked at everything. After a while, I noticed that if there was a Dutch landscape, a rice doll or a Van Goyen, say, that painting would seem to exert a magnetic pull and my father and I would be drawn to it simultaneously. For the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking about what it is about 17th century Dutch landscape painting, about those shimmering silver skies, those tiny figures, the watery reflecting topography that pulls me so inexorably toward them. What gives these paintings such power and force when they are so apparently quiet, when they possess neither dramatic narrative content nor shocking technical virtuosity, 
and when the greatest thing about them seems to be their appreciation of the commonplace. I've also been considering what photographing landscape in 21st century America, which is what I'm doing now, has in common with painting landscape in Holland 400 years ago. In 17th century Holland, the Dutch were involved in forming a national identity in a struggle for independence, in massive land reclamation projects, and in the pursuit of worldly goods. They had an essentially optimistic view of their relationship with the land and thought of it as a place of infinite variety and as a refuge. In the 21st century, we tend to think of nature as either something to be exploited or something to be preserved. But it is not just one way or the other. Everywhere the landscape presents paradox, ambiguity, potential conflict. I'm going to show you a few Dutch landscape paintings from the exhibition, The Poetry of Everyday Life. I chose things which appeal to me as a landscape photographer, and I'm just going to talk about my affinities. Okay, here we go. Um, this painting is Jan van Goyen's landscape of 1629, and for me, it's, it's an amazing example about how light can be used to transform an otherwise relatively drab subject or palette. Notice the mixed light on the ground against the dramatic sky. This is my favorite raking light. And better yet, it's raking light with weather. You can wait a year for that with your camera. This is light that Virginia and I, the woman with whom I collaborate, tend to refer to as the golden hour. And we're always looking for that. We, we often do wait all day for 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. to roll around, and that's the time when we can really work. Look how vast and how controlled the landscape is simultaneously. The horizon line is across the middle. The dramatic sky takes the top half, but the lower half is almost entirely mediated by details of culture. People resting on top of a dune, houses, a track which leads your eye into the picture. The image is lit and not lit. Light foreground and dark background give it amazing scale and drama. The scale of the people are tiny in relationship to the sky, and yet they are not insignificant. The image is really articulated by the human presence. This is a view of Rainin from 1640, also by Van Goyen. And what I love about this picture is that if you look at the horizon line, you discover that the picture is divided left, right, 50-50, half culture, half nature. And yet that's their idea, the idea of landscape, that it can encompass both the cultural world and the natural world. The Dutch essentially invented the genre of naturalistic landscape painting. And in so doing, they made a radical departure from conventions of European art. To be sure, landscape appears in painting before the 17th century, but it is always clearly in the service of something else, of history or morality or as a backdrop to a portrait, for instance. For the 17th century Dutch, landscape was a new, extremely modern view of the countryside, one which celebrated the specificity of nature and saw it as the site of recreation and pleasure. The tiny figures animate the land and show that the Dutch perceived people as an integral part of nature. Van Goyen traveled the length and breadth of the Netherlands. This is also by Van Goyen, landscape with coach and figures by an inn. And he traveled all over the Netherlands, filling his sketchbooks with details of his native landscape. As a painter, he could do what we photographers only yearn to do. He could combine different motifs that he found in the landscape into one extraordinary imaginary landscape. The process is similar, though, in the sense that you're always selecting from what's around you, selecting and rejecting from the infinite aspects of what's there and then making it and seeing it transformed by light. Again, it's the use of shadow and the way that the ground and sky are related. It's so great. 
Um, this is Ert van der Neer, and it's called Moonlit Estuary. And I just want to say one thing about this painting. What interests me is the way it's lit, that it pictures the moment when sunset and moonrise are happening, happening simultaneously. And he's using light to describe the transitory nature of how you perceive a place and how profoundly that's affected by time of day. You can see in the water reflected um, both the sunlight, the sunset and the moonlight. It's very beautiful. This is um, Philips Koenig and it's a panoramic landscape. It's called. I've regularly considered hiring a cherry picker so that I can make landscapes from this kind of high perspective. <laughs> One of the things that's most difficult with landscape is to get a little altitude and also to handle the foreground. And what he's done here is he's got that little figure in there to um, give foreground in interest. And he's also used light to make it, give it variety, plus it's that downhill look. Um, he had to imagine this, because this must have been a really big problem for the Dutch since they were in such a flat place. I love this picture, because of the way that he divides the landscape evenly and then activates every part of the image with light or with water, light on water. And I also love the way that it looks like a map and seems to recede into space sort of indefinitely. Um, here, too, the landscape is articulated by human activity. There are towns, sailboats, the idea of people moving from place to place. This is Jakob von Reistal, and it's called Landscape with Angler Along a Riverbank. And the sky in this is very dramatic, but what really gets me about this painting is the foreground and how um, much he's making use of reflection, how complex the light is in the reflection in the foreground. Um, in all of these paintings, the sky is always extremely mixed and ranges from brightest white to dark grays. Like, like the, light like this really does exist, of course, and I would expect that Holland has some amazing skies because in places that we've photographed, like Iceland and Sri Lanka, which you'll see later, which are islands, of course, I know the Netherlands aren't, but they've got a lot of sea around it, that you get this amazing weather which we're always grateful to have, except when it's raining. Okay, so this is view of Harlem with the country house and grain field. Here, um, von Reistel is working with the idea that a beam of really heavenly light directly illuminates the world of people at their commonplace activities. The spotlight from heaven, which seems to come from this white cloud, comes down and it goes right onto the house and onto the little people moving across the field. So it really gives the idea that um, home is an important place and equates home with nature and with light. In the distance is Harlem, so he's also considering the relationship between city and country. And I love how the, the foreground is almost dark and the way that the sky and the, and the land are reflected in one another. What I respond to in these paintings is the fact that they are all sites of interaction between nature and culture. I love their realism and the fact that they have been criticized persistently for being too realistic. If it looks like the real world, can it really be art? an accusation that has long been leveled at photographs. The English critic John Ruskin recommended burning all Dutch landscape painting. <laughs> I love the fact that Dutch painters cared not that landscape was the lowest form of painting, followed the paths at which they most clearly excelled, patched together interesting lives, and came to their paintings with a subtle sense of meaning. In their work, you see nature, including people, conceived as complete. 
You see time as passing in the present, in the local. In pre-industrial Holland, nature is a refuge, a place of beauty and meaning, and there is great optimism abroad in the world. Now I want to tell you a little bit about my own work. Central to what I do is a consideration of the relationship between people and the land. I have made these photographs in collaboration with Virginia Bean, as I mentioned, in a number of locations, including Iceland, Costa Rica, and southern Italy, Sri Lanka, where this picture was made. These are sluices at a reservoir, and in the United States. In post-war America, landscape photography has largely represented the world as either pure or spoiled. The purists, echoing Ansel Adams, have shown us nature untarnished, while the spoilists have looked at nature as corrupted by the human hand, a repository of trash, strip mines, and nuclear power plants. People and nature are represented as completely incompatible. When we started working together, we tried the purist approach, but as we worked, we came to realize that no part of the Earth's surface is unaltered by human activity, that the idea of an external autonomous nature is a myth, and that our interest lay in looking at the ways in which people have been and are incessantly engaged in a long and complex conversation with the land. This picture is made in Iceland, and this is the I-95 of Iceland, <laughs> unpaved. So it's situated right between a glacier that has a volcano under it and this huge black sand desert. And so when that volcano erupts, water comes pouring across here with the force of the mouth of the Amazon. So it's no point in paving. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes this interaction between nature and culture is harmonious. In other cases, there is discord. Sometimes it is humorous or absurd. But as the Dutch so clearly recognize, and we seem to have all but forgotten, we are a part of nature and cannot get outside of it. In the second year that we worked in Iceland, we made this picture of the Svartsengi geothermal hot water pumping station, also known as the Blue Lagoon. Though we couldn't have said it then, the picture was emblematic of our work on a number of levels. It's a photograph of something entirely benign. Geothermally heated hot water is being pumped out of the ground to supply the people of Reykjavik. They don't use hot water heaters. The earth does it for them. But paradoxically, it looks frighteningly malevolent. It's about leisure, and it's also about work. The light is beautiful, yet beauty and fear are held in tension. The world is at once lovely and scary, and the visual cues are also at odds with the facts, which are supplied to you by the title. Photographers have the challenge of finding moments and places like those, even with a large, clumsy camera like this one. So you can see that sky. There it is. Iceland has those great skies, those silver skies. Unless we're using a computer, which many people have thought about the Blue Lagoon, you can't go home and put it all together. It has to be there, and you have to be lucky and also sensitive and waiting for it at the right moment, and all the ball, on the ball formally, trying to figure out how do I make this composition? How do I construct this from the elements at hand, selecting from the infinite possibilities? We have sought out many aspects of the human relationship with the land, both literal and metaphorical. We have looked at places where people and nature just seem to touch. This is in Hawaii at Volcanoes National Park, and it's lava, 2,000 degrees, hot, flowing into the sea. And those little sticks on the right are the remains of the former visitor center, and the cones are an effort to keep tourists back from the edge. It didn't work very well, but there you go. This is also in Hawaii, another volcanic landscape, red sand beach. There we had some altitude. 
We've also looked at the way the spirit is expressed in the land. And in this case, this is in Iceland in a deforested landscape. All the people who are buried here have um, birch trees planted on them, not gravestones. At History, this is um, Manzanar Japanese American Relocation Camp in the Owens Valley in California. The Owens Valley was once a lush place full of apple trees until the water was um, taken to supply Los Angeles and um, the detritus is left from the Second World War. At Cultivation, and the way that has shaped the land. This is southern Italy. And this is in Sri Lanka. It's um, a tea plantation, Somerset tea plantation. So it's about how colonialism also has shaped the land, and it's about labor. There's my tiny figure. And this is what it looks like when we're actually trying to do these things. And we've also looked at large-scale projects, some of which are neutral and others of which have had either positive or negative effects. This is a town in southern Italy called Matera that um, was all caves and then over the centuries, and people lived in these caves, and then over the centuries they modified the facades, but they're still caves when you go inside. People moved out in the 50s and then have moved back in now. There's probably Armani in those caves by now. <laughs> this is um, windmills in the desert near Palm Springs, and one of those accidental fires for which California is so well known. And um, this is an example of a situation where we, knew, we liked the subject, we were interested in it, we, we knew these dunes were very beautiful, and we kept going back, and we come back to this day after day, different times of day, and there was never the picture there. But then there was this, you know, very unfortunate fire that actually allowed us to make this picture. If we had come an hour before, an hour later, the picture wouldn't have been there. We also wanted, started to ask about how we define what is natural and how we represent nature. In this case, this is a, an orchid show in Hawaii, and it happened at the time of the total eclipse of the sun, for which we went to Hawaii, but this was our best view because it was cloudy where we were. So um, <laughs> in any case, they... It's, so you can ask yourself, here are these orchids all bred like this, but then they're fake ferns, astroturf, pick up those rocks, they weigh about one ounce. So where's the line? <laughs> this is also in Hawaii. It's hills above Lahaina, and the L is for the local football team. If you look at this, as I did with a friend who's a biologist, she said, you know, every single one of those plants in that picture is imported, came to Hawaii after contact with the Europeans. So how do we think about that? Is that natural? Um, anthoriums, a big agri agricultural project in Hawaii, were, also, were brought from Polynesia in canoes by Polynesians, as were palm trees. Tea, too, came to Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, for economic reasons. Tea is from China, not Sri Lanka. This is not to say that these plants aren't natural. It simply reaffirms the idea that though we think it's nature in the timeless sense, it's really nature made over by the movement and interests of people as they cross the world. This is another large scale project in the land which is, um, <laughs> it's, it's a volcano on the strip in Las Vegas. And we, <laughs> we just had to photograph that. And it's, it's, an, it's an ode to what the author Mike Davis calls hydro fetishism. <laughs> in Las Vegas, they use three times more water than residents use in Oakland. And they have less than four inches of rainfall a year. 
So you, it, it celebrates a kind of profligacy with water. So um, it goes off every 20 minutes, and there are sound effects to, to accompany it. J.B. Jackson, a geographer who has been described as the godfather of American landscape studies, looks at the etymology of the word landscape in his book, Vernacular Landscape, and attempts to arrive at a new definition in keeping with contemporary perceptions. He tells us that the dictionary definition says that as a landscape is a portion of the land which the eye can comprehend at a glance and that the word was introduced into English in the 17th century as a way to talk about an artist's interpretation of a view. Later, it came to refer to the view itself. But if you go back further, as Jackson does, beyond English to the Gothic meaning, you find that land originally referred to a plowed field, a place with furrows. As far back as we can trace the word, he writes, land meant a defined space, one with boundaries, though not necessarily fences or walls. The second syllable, scape, meant a collection of similar objects, in the, as in the related word sheaf, meaning bundle. So it seems that landscape was understood as a collection of lands, or in other words, a composition of human-made spaces on the land. So we see that landscape is, quote, not a natural feature of the environment, but a synthetic space, a man-made system of spaces superimposed on the face of the land, functioning and evolving, not according to natural laws, but to serve a community. I suspect no landscape, he writes elsewhere, vernacular or otherwise, can be comprehended unless we perceive it as an organization of space, unless we ask ourselves who owns or uses the spaces, how they were created, and how they change. In the end, I've learned that the revolutionary way the Dutch represented landscape in the 17th century started a visual language which we are still using today to picture and reflect on our relationship with the earth. Thank you. What I thought I would do is to um, perhaps meditate uh, a bit on some of the paintings which I uh, liked very much in, in the show uh, and, and see how um, the idea of those paintings touches on, on what I do. And I think uh, the more I've thought about this, the more I've realized that I've been doing uh, still lives for a very long time, and I, I plan to continue to do more. So this, this show is very apropos of future projects. So I want to thank Ronnie for a terrific show, um, uh, beautiful show too. So let me begin. Can this slide be turned off? I hate the spotlight on me. It's, that's more important. Thank you. I've got five um, still lives that I want to maybe talk a little bit about. Um, it, it, one of the things that I, I began to, to think about uh, was the idea of wh why these paintings should be so interesting to us. And uh, there, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for it. But as an artist, I wanted to sort of investigate the, the, the reasons behind the, the attraction. And um, so um, I think it's also important, um, speaking as an artist, that we understand, and I, I think you all fully understand this, that artists in uh, 17th century uh, Holland were not in the same situation as artists now. The, the connection of artists to society was a much different deal than, than what's happening now. We, yes, we do still have a market, and yes, there are still people who want to have that flower photograph to go with their sofas. Uh, so that pressure does exist, but overall, I think there's a certain, uh, well, a huge more of, of a sense of freedom uh, as contemporary artists to do what we will. So. Obviously, these paintings have to be seen within the light of 
the pressures of the times and the buyers and what they needed to see. And um, not to limit them by saying this, but it's, it's important to understand that. Um, uh, Ronnie mentioned that I, I came from Cuba. We were a young refugee at, in New York City at 1962, and uh, before I bore you too long with refugee stories, uh, we food was a very important thing <laughs> when we got, got to New York. Um, in fact, I used to my sister and I used to tour AMPs and take flash pictures of of rows of food and food. It was. Uh, I mean, now would be, you know, we would get a Guggenheim for sure, that kind of work. But, <laughs> uh, but um, maybe uh, to begin to do, uh, to speak about this picture, um, by Peter uh, Kloss, um, about a certain kind of abundance and the pleasure of having a lot and, and having not just a lot, but being able to, uh, to afford to not eat it. <laughs> Uh, it's, 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 it's saying quite a lot. And I think um, uh, many of these uh, still lives have that sense of, uh, sort of a show-off sense of, we got it and, you know, check this out. Um, the, um, the, it's not, uh, not just the sense of having a lot, though, that interests me in this picture. It's the... Um, the sense of uh, maybe what time it is in, in this scene. And I often uh, at least dream or imagine that many of these scenes are painted sort of the morning after. It's a little bit like a sex picture. <laughs> the, obviously, the light is coming in from the left. This is not fluorescent light. This is a window light. So um, that fact interests me. Just what time is this? And are they sleeping after the party? And if they've had a lot to drink, they're sleeping late. And it, it, it's an interesting question for me as an artist to, to think about these uh, parameters, you know, what time, when, um, things like that. It's another one by um, Peter Kloss, Breakfast Piece. And um, another sort of meditational question that I had um, has to do with, well, the fact that, that these paintings look um, very real and, and they're beautifully crafted as uh, the real world and it's part of their charm, obviously. But, you know, the more you look at these things, the more you realize that they're, you know, fictions. They're not, <laughs> it's not the real world that's being seen here. Uh, it's a very seducing world, but um, I think a lot about how, um, you know, the idea of this genre of still lives. And by the way, Laura mentioned that, that landscape was the lowest. You know, landscape is, I mean, still lives is the lowest. <laughs> I think uh, people who've made still lives were kind of considered kind of like craftsmen, you know, well, you know, that's probably the best you could do. Um, so the idea of, of, of these paintings, um, in a way, uh, you know, what's, what interests me is the, idea that the modesty of them. It's not uh, Krakatoa exploding, you know. This is just, you know, a bunch of little things uh, put together. But in, in that sense, it's the most free of the, of the genres. I mean, who's to say that the bread should be more to the left, you know? The artist has full command on this. And I really, in my own work, I, I, I like the idea of inventing the whole thing. And, uh, you know, beyond that, um, the idea that you could sort of light it in a way that is um, seemingly from a window on the left, but that window is quite high. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to suggest here that the, the whole thing is very fictionalized that what seems real, in fact, is not. And I think that the artists who made these paintings obviously knew what they were doing, the sense of inviting you in. Oh, isn't it charming? Isn't that a night table? And once you go in there, you realize that the whole thing is quite a weird drama going on. And uh, that aspect of it, that tension, is very much tied up with the, the kind of work that I like to do, this opposing you know, set of forces. 
By the way, um, I'm not going to write a PhD about this and all like that, but that pie there looks like a piece of meat to me, too. Um, a lot of exposure. It, it's, it, uh, I'm going out on the wing here, but this uh, subtle cruelty in a lot of these pictures. Um, I don't know where that comes from, but a certain sense of not only having it, but cutting it. Um, it's a weird sense of controlling what you have and also abusing it a little bit. It's uh, Again, I, I don't know where that comes from, but I really sense that a lot. The impossibility of objects that, that overturned a uh, metal uh, holder there. I've been looking at it for a while, and it, if you actually measure the thing, it doesn't quite fit. <laughs> it's an impossible object. It's, it's not because the artist was... Uh, a bad artist. It's just that there's a certain sense of inventing a space within um, what seems to be just a window into the world. That is quite wonderful. That light again from the top left, that's quite weird. It's not your typical Vermeer light. Um, the, uh, also the idea of, um, you know, I'm just getting a lot of ideas from my own work, um, that an artist has, uh, these artists had the sense that, well, okay, it's just things on a table. But within that, they could make all kinds of sociological and psychological, you know, things. Like, for instance, you know, who's fared the better? You know, who's, who's, uh, who survived this party better? You know, uh, what hasn't been cut? Uh, what hasn't been smoked? Um, who's on the edge? <laughs> The idea of these plates, I've loved these. Uh, I don't know why psychologically they, were, they, sh they make me feel like they're about to commit suicide, but there's a sense of things just being on the edge of it that's quite interesting. And I think it's very telling as a kind of a part of the, the artist's craft to make us feel something. Um, it feels like uh, you want to hold that thing before it falls. Uh, and it occurs a lot, these about to fall objects. The fiction of it continues in many other paintings like this, I mean, really wonderful picture of painting of, of peaches by Willem uh, van Aalst. Uh, I mean, these peaches, uh, it's Hollywood. <laughs> you know, before Hollywood, two very sexy peaches with pretty evil light coming, uh, emanating from them. It's, um, it's part of what I was trying to say before about this fictionalized world, that it's no longer just a beautiful thing that one could touch. It's beyond our touching. It's about desire, but maybe it's not quite fulfilled. It's this dark, weird um, uh, thing to maybe obey. Um, so uh, I would... I would Suggest that you look at a lot of these paintings again and, and try to enter them with the kind of theatricalness that, that they have, that they're quite un, unrelated to your own kitchen. It's not really what's happening. <laughs> it's a different matter. This last one, it's, it's such a wonderful thing. It's, uh, um, I, I mean, I, it's not a good slide, so you cannot see the edge of, of the table. Um, t a couple of questions uh, and from this painting and other paintings. The idea of why the edge of, of the table? There are a lot of edges. The very edge is being shown. The rest of the table is not being shown. Are we to, to think that this table goes for a mile? It's the sort of the imaginative nature of maybe the way the paintings can suggest wealth. Oh, that table really did go a mile. There was a lot more. Oh, also, this sense that this is a little bit like um, an invention of the world. Uh, many of these still lives have no background, so you, there's no context. So it, you don't see a table with fruit and say, and see a chair and a table and a window. Um, they have this sense of being totally invented worlds, and that is really quite a nice invention. <laughs> The idea of saying, right here in my kitchen, I can make a brand new world. Um, it's very exciting to see it, an art that's almost 300 years old. 
Um, and uh, the last thing I want to say about this is sort of this, I know that Columbus had discovered America by this time, but there's almost a suggestion in these still lives that the world was still kind of believing that it was flat. <laughs> there was a, sort of a sense in these tabletops that the edge is scary. Things sitting in there are protected and enclosed and safe, but beyond that, who knows? Um, I'm sure there's some maybe psychological thinking around the time of a certain kind of feeling of maybe like the way we have now. We have it all, but shit, you know, who knows about tomorrow. Um, let me go uh, sort of much further. Uh, the three major inventors of photographer, um, you know, wonderfully uh, all at once, you know, event, uh, Niepce, French, uh, very early photograph, 1928, oh, sorry, 1828, <laughs> that, that would change history, 1828, early photograph, still life, Daguerre, 1837, a still life, Fox Talbot, 1840-41, still alive. And one of my favorite still lives by him, uh, Fox Talbot. It's his books, something that I have a little bit of you know, love for. But uh, I think about this, photographers at the time like things being still. Long exposures are a pain. Um, what better subject than a still life? So, um, not that um, taking pictures of people is, is impossible anymore, but there's a certain uh, pleasure in having something in front of you uh, that's not going to go away. I want to show you now some, <laughs> some of my own work and how it, I hope I can convey some of the sense of how so Dutch art uh, has me going crazy about doing some new work because it is really quite an inspiring show. Um, this is when my son Brady was little and this is our living room. This is our, it was a still life. Uh, but the kind of still life I'm not interested in, chaos. It's inter interesting to me that uh, when around 87, 88, 89, 90, I began to make, make still lives. Thinking back, maybe it was because of this mess that I began to actually say, let's look at something contained, something that suggests maybe wildness, but something that has an edge to it. So these are really early pictures that I made during his young childhood. Long exposures, looking at these objects, maybe as part of understanding my own youth, maybe. But I think beyond that, what I learned from making these pictures was this sort of weird sense of not rushing about, not uh, thinking about taxes or, you know, the end of the world, but this very beautiful object in front of me. It's what these touch painters must have felt uh, making these pictures. As many allegorical reasons they had for doing these pictures, you know, this means Christ and that means death. and. They really, part of their success has to do with how well they looked at these things and paying attention to, to, to the thing itself. It, it matters a great deal. I, I had to pay attention to these um, modest but important objects in my life. It was about my son growing up and my, you know, being um, wonderful and crazy and um, I could invent on a table all kinds of uh, uh, private reasons for measuring him. <laughs> These objects, um, which uh, you know, I'm convinced have, have a life of their own. You know, it's it's the rosebud that we all have. Um, um, I think it have to do uh, with. Um, 
the sense that we're, we're, our souls, our feelings are attached to certain things. So uh, for me, it was important to, um, to notice them and to sort of pay them back, so to speak. This is, uh, one of, this is Brady's first saving account. <laughs> it's broken now. <laughs> But it was really quite a, a good time for me to be able to meditate on, on the very, the, the, not, not um, you know, unexciting things, but quiet uh, things of importance. And I'm still convinced, although I, I'm jealous of Laura, you know, going to these wonderful places. I'm, I, I tend to want to find it on my table. <laughs> Um, but I, I am of two minds about this. I would love to go out and, and do the world, but oftentimes the table in front of you has wonderful events as well. Um, these are all early photographs again. A um, sandbox. This is still life. Uh, water became interesting to me, as is interesting to a lot of us. <laughs> Um, as a way to maybe um, speak about time, um, having enough time be between his naps, so I can make a 10 minute exposure of water falling. And of course, you know, when I think about these paintings now, I think, well, hell, I mean, I got two eggs in there. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it, it means something. It's not like I'm a total um, primitive and I just go, well, I don't know, eggs. No, I, one chooses things for a reason. Uh, they could be overly symbolic, and that tends to be a little bit trivial, but eggs, you know, you figure it out. <laughs> Two wine glasses, like Lisa and me, perhaps. Even the, the, the most banal objects in my kitchen um, I wanted to make into something significant. Uh, perhaps this is an example of, you know, seeing my destiny in a paper bag, but um, uh, <laughs> I'd rather just, for now, see it as a paper bag. Very beautiful things happen when you pay attention and look at things for a while. And it's not, I, I'm a genius and I can just ugh, find these things. It really is a matter of just saying, okay, today I'm going to look at this shell. You look at it for a while, it becomes interesting. And if you're an artist, you might make a picture of it, and that takes it to a whole different level. But these Dutch landscapes have to do with the magic of someone saying, this is important, um, let's really render them in, in, in a way that, you know, brings them back to us. Water pouring out of a pot. Uh, it's, I, I, it's funny, I mean, I, I hadn't thought of this, but this is like one of those Dutch still lives, you know, with a party afterwards, you know, my whiskey or something, you know. <laughs> I'm snoring somewhere. Um, um, who knows? Maybe I had this in mind that those genre paintings of um, careful disarray, where maybe a spill can become Africa or South America. Um, chaos in some kind of contained place. This is long exposure of uh, soapy, greasy water moving inside a pan. In that sense, uh, maybe I'm reaching here, but the sense that the pot contains this craziness, it's a little bit like those, some of these still lives I spoke about where the table contains the mess. There's a sense that within that area, something crazy can happen, something messy can happen, but it's within a, a form that uh, elevates them to a different order. Uh, water on a table. And maybe the world, the way the world was created as a map, maybe that's the way God made Madagascar, I don't know. 
this is a more planned thing. This is Africa in water. Um, I, I share a lot of uh, interest with the Dutch. I mean, uh, there's no question to my mind. Now, I, w- I was involved with the David Hockney conference in New York. On, uh, you know, his premise that really early painters painters used optical means to to paint. I mean, he goes back as Van Eyck. You know, I mean, it's sacrilege. You know, um, but I am convinced that you know these optical things, glasses and mirrors and um, polish silver had, d- did have optical qualities that you know that can be seen as lenses this is a glass of wine this is right here in my kitchen it becomes a really wonderful lens uh, I wanted to teach what photography was like again it's another still life it's really been interesting I, I, I want to thank Ronnie for all this because I've been now I sort of have a direction <laughs> Still, still live photographer. That's my tombstone. <laughs> this is, uh, I've had, I, I mean, some failures. This is one that I've been working on for a while. Uh, it's not happening yet, but I'm sort of interested in doing time exposures where things that seem to be solid are kind of disappearing. Uh, early still life and that light is coming a little bit like one of those um, you know uh, Claus's uh, lights you know where is that light coming from is that God in Quincy Uh, still life (laughs) This is a recent photograph of a really damaged book. And um, I, I suppose that in, in, a, in a certain way it could be considered to be part of the continuum of early still lives, you know, where books begin to signify a certain kind of, um, you know, life or the end of a life. It's a truly tiny book. <laughs> Again, on a table. I don't know what this means. <laughs> when I was speaking earlier about the difference between the Dutch painters and us now as artists, I mean, Yes, we're not totally free, but there's a certain sense that uh, as a photographer, I can invent whatever I want. I mean, I could drill a hole through a book, uh, you know, if I want to. <laughs> uh, it may not sell, but um, there's a certain sense of having one's agenda uh, about, you know, whatever one, one feels to put it into, into the still life, to include it as part of how you want the world to be or, you know, Ought to be. Uh, pencil tip. Uh, pencil and shadow. And we're almost done here. A, a bad picture. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's trying to be really heavy. Uh, and it didn't work. There's lots of those, uh, you know, in the boxes. This is uh, one that I've been actually, I made about 10 years ago. I just found it. And it's, it's not a good picture, but it's an interesting picture to me because I, I want to work on it some more. This is, it was a pain to do because it was a 10-minute exposure, and as the exposure was being made, I would take things in and out. So it's, it was like a three-ring circus. Take the pepper out, put the banana in. <laughs> and then trying to keep a notebook of, what was where, you know. Um, I think if I do it now, I'll be a little bit more zen than, than that. But um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, trying to be a Dutch artist 
uh, in the year 2002, you know, trying to uh, use the convention to speak about other um, dra dramas that, that we may be feeling now. Maybe things are temporary. Um, anyway, it's not a good picture, but it's one that I will have as a model for, for more. Um, even when I don't have anything on the table, sunlight becomes the motif. I feel like Monet. <laughs> so maybe the third one should be like bottles and wine and stuff. Okay, I'm almost done here. Um, this is a fairly recent picture, and it, it's, a, it's a still life, and uh, with an, a thing that I'm trying to work with, uh, mirrors. So this is called Book and Mirror on Round Table. It even has the classical title of a still life. But it's a sense of, um, and I think with my work, and I think the best of the work that's in the show now, there's a, f a sense that you're entering a logical space, something normal, yet when you spend time with it, you realize how strange and, and how the logic is really odd. It's been full with. And I think that kind of um, strategy, in a way, sort of leads one to maybe look at the world again with some fresh eyes. And just, oh, I thought I understood mirrors, or I thought I understood what what they did. Uh, at least that's my hope to sort of re reinvigorate what we thought we knew. And this is the last picture. Uh, I made this about two months ago, and I, f I was thinking about the the whole idea of vanitas in in Dutch art. Uh, many of these paintings have the sense, uh, have things included in them that suggest that how temporary life is, how, how we're going to die at some point and nothing lasts. It, very intentionally put there. Well, this continues in some ways. I, when I found these books at the Boston Public Library, first thing I thought about was 9-11. I said, those are 9-11 books. And it took me a long time to make a picture that was not utterly a symbol of what happened, but maybe touched on it. Um, but I wanted to be true to the nature of the thing themselves, you know, what these books are like. So um, perhaps this is my own sort of uh, inheritance of the, the Dutch idea that uh, one could, could express one's feelings through uh, ordinary objects. Thank you very much.